The August 20th, 2019 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Let's start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United hold our county commission meeting this evening. This is the first week back to school for many students in Buncombe County. So before we begin our business meeting, let's have a moment for silent reflection or silent prayer for appreciation of all the people who work hard to make our schools a welcoming and nurturing place for our kids to learn and grow. Please join us in a moment of silence. Thank you again for being with us for our meeting this evening. I've got a couple of announcements to make. Uh, the first is that if you used the county parking deck to uh, park for, uh, to attend this meeting or used uh, the actual transit system to attend the meeting, you can get validation for your parking or transit passes from one of the uh, officers who is with us this evening. Feel free to see them on your way out and that validation is for today only. Let me read the ethics reminder to the board. In accordance with the Code of Ethics adopted by the Board, all County Commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the Governing Board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any Board member? Also, does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the board at this meeting. And um, before we go further, I wanted to acknowledge that um, I saw Sheriff Quinton Miller with us this evening. Sheriff, thank you for joining us for our meeting this evening. It's always good to see you, and thank you and to all members of your team for your, your great work in Buckingham County. All right, we come to our consent agenda. Are there any questions about any item on the consent agenda, or is there a motion to approve the consent agenda and to follow the remainder of the agenda as it's published? So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, great, thank you. All right, we've got a couple of items under good news, and uh, Commissioner Belcher and I are going to uh, come down and to uh, for the purpose of congratulating Buncombe County's Teacher of the Year. So we're going to come down to the podium. 
methods. On behalf of the Bowman County Commission, we would like to congratulate J.D. Haplin as the Buncombe County Teacher of the Year. J.D. Haplin is the 2020 Buncombe County Schools Teacher of the Year. In his classroom, he believes there's only one way to be, your very best. The Pisgah Elementary School fourth grade teacher makes sure that no student spends the day sitting down. The children walk each other through math problems in class groups and on the interactive whiteboard. And Mr. Haplin teaches them to give each other open, honest feedback. The classroom ethic center, centers around working hard and working smart. He gives his students jobs and tasks in the classroom, and places them in leadership roles. He teaches his students to be good people and good citizens. Haplin believes that teaching isn't just a job, it's a life of calling. So congratulations, I'm going to invite Commissioner Belcher to share a few words as well. All right, thank you. So I, I get an opportunity to, uh, and I won't we'll correct the spelling on that, it's Mr. Halpin. Halpin. Yeah, Sorry. Mr. Halpin, that's okay. Uh, I have a connection with, uh, with Mr. Halpin. He, was uh, the teacher of my grandson, uh, Caden, and Caden uh, loved him dearly as he did all the teachers at, at Pillsgood. And uh, I appreciate his leadership, I appreciate his role model, I appreciate the way he interacts with all, all the kids. And uh, I've been at school several, several times as Caden went up. Uh, Pillsgood is a jewel in the mountains of North Carolina. We, uh, we love the school as we do all the it's about a mile from my house, so I, I love it a little more than some of the others. Just. <laughs> um, but I would like for uh, Mr. Halpin to come up and say a few words, but I'd also like for him to, uh, to recognize the, those that are here from Pisgah, if they would stand up. And when you come up, if you would, if you would mention their names, and then when we're finished, we're going to get everybody together for a, for a, a good picture, including all the, all the commissioners. But, but congratulations, and uh, uh, we appreciate what you do for our children. First of all, commissioners, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to recognize and support educators in Buncombe County and for the tireless efforts you put into making our county better. So I appreciate that. It's an honor to be here, and what makes my job so fulfilling and so rewarding is the staff we have at Pisgah and the talent we have in Buncombe County. So I'd like to recognize Ben Ricker. He's our Director of Communications, as professional and talented as they come. I saw Barry Pace, who is head of technology, absolutely fabulous, what an asset to our county. And I'd like to recognize my principal, who can be principal of the year every year, Ms. Yates, you need to stand up, honey. <laughs> and try to make a positive impact on the lives of fourth graders at Pisgah Elementary. I want to also take this time to thank Dr. Baldwin and Ms. Swanger for their leadership in Buncombe County. Their steady leadership over longer than a decade has really helped Buncombe County have a brighter future and a better tomorrow, and I'd like to, to thank them for that. It's been an honor and privilege to be Teacher of the Year for Buncombe County. When you're surrounded by greatness and talent, it can only make you a little bit better. So, I've learned a lot. It's been a rewarding and humbling experience, and I appreciate your support tonight and all the work that everyone here does. So, good days ahead for Buncombe County. Thank you.
Next up, we want to um, acknowledge North Carolina's 100, 100 distinguished public health nurses. And Stoney Blevins is with us to help present this item. Stoney, come on up. Thank you for being here. Good evening, commissioners and uh, members of the public. I'd like to ask our distinguished nurses to come up and join me, as well as our uh, public health director, Jan Shepard, and our medical director, Dr. Mullendor, um, there who make this award great, just the liver of the news. Um, just want to say that this is the 100th year of public health nursing in North Carolina, so as a part of that centennial celebration, uh, the State Division of Public Health decided to award 100 distinguished public health nurses across the whole state. Uh, this is a very high honor, and uh, nurses have to be uh, nominated and chosen from among not just every county in North Carolina, but also state staff as well as university staff who teach public health nursing. And I could not be prouder to say that of those 100 nurses in the state of North Carolina, nine of those distinguished nurses work for Buncombe County. So, uh, We do have a couple that couldn't be here today. It's the first day of school. It's been a very busy day for both <laughs> But we have Susan Creed, Mary Backlund, Denise Club, Michelle Lee, Haley McPeters, um, Sharon Raines, Cheryl Rainey, Cindy Runyon, and Wendy Young. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> It's a great accomplishment and uh, reflects well on all of your teams that are here in So thank you so much. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda this evening. Uh, econ an update on economic development activities in FY. 19 and Tim Love, our business officer, is going to present this item. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, this evening, wanted to reflect on FY19 from an economic development perspective. Uh, we talk a lot about economic development. We don't always present it to you in a single presentation, so really wanted to take that opportunity this evening to look back on FY19. Uh, to do that, uh, I've asked Clark Duncan to join us. He's sitting here in the front row. Clark is the Executive Director for the Economic Development Coalition for the Asheville area. And at this point, I'm going to transition into a slide presentation. We'll try to be brief, but I uh, wanted to give you something to look at. All right. So for our agenda today, I want to talk a little bit about the partnership. Economic development isn't something in and of itself. You know, it takes a lot of folks working together. I want to talk specifically about the work of the EDC um, and 
you know, Chairman Whiteside sits on that board and sees it up to close and personal, but wanted to share with, with y'all as well as the public uh, the programs that are available through the EDC. I want to talk a little bit about our active projects. Uh, there's clearly a lot of projects that come before this board. We wanted to provide a status <coughs> on what those projects are. I want to talk about return on investment. How do these projects look over time? How are we doing? And then finally, we'll talk about moving forward. Uh, in terms of economic development in Buncombe County, uh, Tons of partners at the table, uh, the EDC of course, uh, local governments, the city of Asheville, town of Black Mountain, uh, towns of Weaverville, everyone's playing a part. Uh, the state of North Carolina plays a key part for us, departments of transportation and commerce uh, with their work, you know, grants to AD Tech, uh, roads to industrial parks, things of that nature. The federal government plays a role through the Appalachian Regional Commission through grant funding. Additionally, uh, we'd love to call out our regional partners such as the Land of Sky, uh, who really provide a lot of access to uh, broader uh, resources for us. And then must call out our schools. Uh, AB Tech is one of our closest partners. Their customized training program is critical to the success of a lot of our employers. Uh, but also want to call out our local schools. Uh, the training programs that they put in place, the students that they educate, uh, CTE programs are critical to the work that we do. Also want to take a moment to call out some of our related organizations that you may not think about from an economic development standpoint, but I would argue are critical as well. So small business development, organizations like Asheville Chamber, Carolina Small Business, Mountain BizWorks. From a sports and recreational tourism perspective, the Sports Commission is a key player recruiting new events to this region. Um, additionally, the TDA. Um, all of this sort of comes together to create our economic <coughs> development puzzle. Just wanted to take this brief moment to reflect on those organizations. With that said, the EDC is one of our key partners, so I'm going to ask Clark uh, to step up and uh, present on the EDC's work, uh, as well as the partnership that has been in place for 25 plus years. Thank you, Tim. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, my name is Clark Duncan, and it is my privilege to serve as Executive Director for the Economic Development Coalition. Um, thank you for this opportunity to brief you on some of our outcomes and accomplishments for the last fiscal year that we conduct uh, in the name of Buncombe County. Let me begin with my sincere thanks for the stewardship of this commission uh, over the last two and a half decades. It was in fact 25 years ago this summer, I think it was under the leadership of Chairman Gene Rainey, uh, that the county uh, created the Economic Development Coalition. And in the interim years, uh, that uh, coalition has grown to include stakeholders and funders from the city of Asheville, uh, from the Asheville Area Chamber, and over 85 uh, private investors uh, from the public sector, excuse me, from the private sector across Buncombe County that share uh, your vision for broad community prosperity uh, in this community. So for context, uh, the EDC board has 20 members, nine of those appointed, 11 ex officio. We're currently chaired by Mr. Michael McGuire, who is a site leader and senior vice president for Thermo Fisher uh, out in Weaverville. Uh, our ex officio members run the gamut from city and county management uh, to superintendents for both our county and city school systems, the airport director, the Manufacturing Executives Association, the Chamber, uh, as well as our partners at Duke Energy and PSNC, now Dominion Energy. Our mission and our purpose is grounded in the belief that meaningful employment for today's generation results in better outcomes in education healthcare, and well-being for the next generation. Uh, we focus on and define economic prosperity as a more balanced and diversified economy. Obviously, quality jobs and economic mobility for all of our residents. Raising the standard of living for Buncombe County residents through raising the average wage for Buncombe County households. And finally, growing sustainable tax base that leads uh, strategic investments by this body in things like infrastructure and education uh, and public safety. So let me share that I'm uh, proud to uh, be one of only 62 accredited economic development organizations in North America uh, by the International Economic Development <coughs> Council. So as such, we follow four key pillars for best practices in economic development. And that includes industry expansion and workforce development, Staff also committed to community marketing and recruitment through targeted industries uh, and recruiting complementary businesses and corporate investors to Buncombe County. 
It also includes a ground-up strategy for growing the next generation of headquartered businesses here in Buncombe County through the programs of what we call Venture Asheville, connected, uh, excuse me, committed to connecting and mentoring and funding those most promising startups. And finally, Riverbird Research, encouraging data-driven decision-making both for private sector growth uh, and public sector governance. I'm going to start with that framework to walk you through each of those four pillars to talk about some of our outcomes uh, for the last fiscal year, but as well as some program impacts that may go unnoticed by the public at large. Uh, for example, uh, in October of last year, we worked with the German manufacturer Reich LLC out in Vista Industrial Park to announce an expansion that catalyzed $11 million in new investment, 15 new jobs at above Buncombe County average wages, and this expansion required zero additional support in terms of Buncombe County incentives. It's also <coughs> important to note, this was one of the best kind of expansions. Reich just arrived in Buncombe County in 2009, and for them to announce expansion plans so soon after that is a compliment to those that do business in this community. Uh, we also work with East Fork Pottery, an incredibly exciting manufacturer uh, just south of Asheville High on McDowell, announcing 75 new jobs, over $2.5 million in new machinery and equipment. They're one of only two artisan manufacturers, uh, potters if you will, that are scaling for national and international distribution here in the United States. Uh, they're a great reflection of the artisan manufacturing community here in Western North Carolina. A really important program impact of our work with existing industry is workforce development, and specifically mentorship. Chairman Whitesides joined us for the rollout of our new mentorship program next to ABL uh, in May of this year. Uh, that is a partnership with UNC Asheville, Western Carolina, and Warren Wilson, partnering Buncombe County professionals with rising sophomores, juniors, and seniors uh, to help them see themselves and their future success and their careers, most importantly, here in Buncombe County. It also allows us to very intentionally recruit students of color, students from immigrant communities, and students that may be first in family to attend college. These are students uh, that need more of our social capital as local professionals, and also, frankly, maybe have the hardest time seeing their future success in Buncombe County. We're also working very closely with AB Tech on growing an apprenticeship consortium in manufacturing, and I've worked for over 12 years as a proud partner of the city and the county with Kayla, the City of Asheville Youth Leadership Academy, also bringing our students into local manufacturing settings throughout the year, and especially in our upcoming National Manufacturing Week, and also bringing our educators, our most influential um, folks that spend more time with our kids sometimes than we do, uh, bringing those educators into the halls of manufacturing uh, to expose them to career opportunities here in Buckingham County. Another important impact in workforce development investments is going to be around the subject of economic mobility. There's an expression that I think embodies why we all work in economic development, which is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, and so we continue to partner with local agencies such as the Asheville Housing Authority, and Upskill WNC, and Green Opportunities, uh, both for capacity building, but then also to connect them with fast-growing employers in our community so more of our residents can experience uh, the growth in our economy uh, that we've seen over the course of the last 10 years. And lastly, career connectivity. Uh, the EDC is proud with the support of the uh, Buncombe County Commission to host two of the largest recruitment events in all of Western North Carolina last year, connecting over 3,000 residents with 150 participating employers. We do this now twice a year at the Ag Center this last year, opening our doors three hours early for over 700 local high school students to come in and have private one-on-one -on -one time with all of those employers that were participating for career exploration. Uh, that was a really rewarding experience uh, to see those eyes opening for the first time. I'm going to pivot now to talk about recruiting industry, which is frankly sometimes what people most think about when they think of economic development. And it's the second of the pillars I'd like to chat about. Uh, we worked very closely with the staff and the commission last year uh, to announce an expansion and a new investment in Inca Commerce Park for Hawkon Industries. They are headquartered out of Vancouver, Canada. This is their first manufacturing investment in the southeast. 
where they'll be building a $20 million facility that will create over 160 high-paying jobs in the county. Uh, they make custom HVAC equipment for industrial, academic, hospital, and institutional construction projects. We also worked with Fox Factory on their grand opening. These folks came out of their headquarters in Scotts Valley, California. If any of you have been on a mountain bike in the last few years, it likely had a Fox Factory shock on it. Clearly a lot of affinity for the mountains of western North Carolina. Uh, they're creating over 65 jobs in South Duncan County, right across the uh, interstate from the airport, in fact, um, that would be focused on sales, service, uh, and high-value jobs like research and development for those shocks that they then test, by the way, on the tracks over at Bent Creek. A really important impact of our recruitment ventures will be attracting outside dollars, such as uh, state and federal funds, to grow and invest in infrastructure needed for economic development here in Buckingham County. A couple quick case studies I know you're familiar with, from Black Mountain Commerce Park, uh, working with Land of Sky, DOT, ARC, Golden Leaf, and the Economic Development Administration uh, to support uh, over $3.7 million in combined funds to extend access roads and water and sewer uh, for the Avatom Technologies project. There's still significant acreage in that park that will attract yet more job creation activity. And in Inca Commerce Park, uh, we are bringing a uh, from, from our lips to the years I've got here, $2.8 million home from ARC and other sources to complete some interior access roads that will open up well over 55 new pad-ready acres, which is highly unusual in Buncombe County for economic development. We're very excited to see those <coughs> dollars, uh, those outside dollars invested in our community. I'll pivot to talk about the third pillar, which is really your grow your own strategy, which is such a tremendous reflection on who we are as a community. Uh, our Venture Asheville programs, specifically our team mentoring service, has helped over 50 Buncombe County startups launch over the course of the last five years. We lean on a talented group of over 54 mentors. We facilitated nearly, facilitated nearly $4 million in equity funding to put into those startups over the course of the last fiscal year alone. And we also launched an angel investor network locally to invest in local firms that in the last fiscal year uh, put over $195,000 into those funds to ensure their foundational success. The most direct economic uh, or programmatic impact, of course, is having an ecosystem where small business and entrepreneurship can thrive in Buffalo County. Uh, the most notable, a uh, couple notable events from last year, we rented a, a, a van, put six of our most promising startups in that van, and we drove them to Charlotte, uh, Durham, and Raleigh, and RTP to pitch to investors. They received over a million dollars in uh, equity commitments in that road trip that they now are bringing home to grow their businesses here in Buckland County. Sometimes you have to bootstrap funding uh, in Western North Carolina, and I'm really proud of, uh, of our participants. We also launched our Venture 15 Awards, which I'd invite each of you to. This coming December will be our second annual, where we recognize the 15 fastest growing startups in this community. Just for context and size, I will share last year that top 15 represented over $52 million in revenues. So these are high potential, fast scaling companies that will be serving markets nationally and internationally out of their Franklin County headquarters. And the fourth pillar is really grounding everything that we do in sound and defensible research. Our research uh, director, Heidi Ryber, joins me here this evening. Uh, she responded to over 220 requests last year, many on behalf of Buncombe County, uh, supporting your bond reporting efforts, economic impact studies, media requests, and often really highly customized studies of workforce and industry to help our prospects and our existing businesses make better uh, decisions for their future stability. We host events like the Metro Economy Outlook. It's upcoming on October the 18th. I hope we might also see you there. One particular research project I would draw your attention to in the last fiscal year, we launched really the first ever employer survey for the entire 10 county labor shed. So think about that. 10 counties of residents get up in the morning and come to work in the breadbasket of Buncombe County. 
And so we wanted to survey those 10 counties of employers. We got over 700 respondents, individual companies. Um, and then took that data working with uh, internationally leading labor analytics firm EMSI to produce a skills gap analysis that we're already sharing with our partners at the Mountain Area Workforce Development Board and AB Tech and others to make sure that our strategies are not based on anecdotes but on real-time data for the future uh, growth of our economy. In all, in the, over the course of the last fiscal year, uh, we now serve 250 new jobs at average wages of nearly $42,000, attracting nearly $33 million in new tax base in Buncombe County. The second column there represents just our entrepreneurial outcomes in Venture Asheville, launching 25 new startups that represent $14 million in new revenue locally that created 108 new jobs, proving our investments in entrepreneurship development pay off in big and meaningful ways. I want to give you a, a quick snapshot as I close on our return on the investments that you make a valuable Buncombe County tax dollars into our shared initiatives in economic <coughs> development. Since 2015, over the course of the last four years, uh, we facilitated uh, announcements totaling nearly $196 million in new tax base in this community. Over a thousand direct new jobs, those are jobs in, uh, where that are locally employed, creating over $117 million in new labor income that will result in over $9 million in new tax collections locally. Uh, for every $1 invested by Buncombe County, that's a return of $90 in new lo labor income in this community. And we're grateful for your continued partnership I think I'm going to hand off the uh, clicker here to Tim, but we'll be available for questions. Okay, thanks, Clark. Thank you, Clark. And uh, I felt it was important for that presentation and for you all to see some of the services and programs that you don't hear about quite as much uh, from the EDC. But with that said, I, I want to spend some time on one of the programs we do spend a lot of time. And when we think about economic development, if you're reading headlines, you're probably thinking about incentives, uh, if you're looking nationally. And so I wanted to spend time looking at that program today and the return on investment. Uh, for those that are not familiar, uh, Buncombe County has an economic development investment policy. Uh, the purpose is to broaden and diversify the development of businesses in our community. Uh, our incentives are based around capital investment. So if you're expanding our tax base or if you're creating new jobs, uh, that's how we incentivize. I wanted to share that with the public, uh, but I know the board is clearly familiar with it. Uh, examples of projects that uh, have been funded through the Economic Development Incentive Program over the years, starting way on the far left, ABL Technologies, a homegrown company that started in uh, Enca uh, AB Tech Campus. Uh, Ingalls, not the retail, but the distribution centers. Uh, Linamar, GE Aviation, we spent a lot, a lot of time thinking about these folks. Um, in addition, a bottom of the largest uh, announcement we've ever had, 550 new jobs. So just a few examples of our projects. But uh, from there, I wanted to get into the numbers a little bit. So let's talk about the economic development agreements that have been approved uh, by this board or a previous board. Uh, these are the active EDAs on the screen. Uh, each company is listed as well as the date of their public hearing, the total economic development agreement value, as well as the total dispersed, and then a percentage dispersed on the, on the far right. Why am I showing you this? Um, showing you because a lot of your funding uh, has not been dispersed yet. Uh, for a multitude of reasons, meaning companies may not have hit their incentives or maybe they're further along in, uh, in the pipeline and we still need time to see how they perform. Uh, one of those uh, companies, Jacob Holm, uh, they are 95% complete. Uh, that's because they're approaching the end of their agreement and will roll off this year. I wanted to, sh to show you uh, the status of these funds that you've approved. Um, again, um, many of these companies are performing well, but wanted you to know that uh, the funding is being watched and uh, has not been fully dispersed at this point. Shifting gears a little bit, I really want to talk about the performance of these companies, and we'll do so in three ways. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, there's an A and a B and a C. Um, the A indicates uh, those are jobs, so we'll talk about that section, then we'll focus on the average wages in section B, and then in section C we'll talk about capital investment. For each of these companies, we've given them just a quick uh, color coding. So green means they're on schedule. Uh, yellow means they're not necessarily off schedule, but haven't hit their targets at this point. 
So from a jobs perspective, you can see that Ingalls Distribution Center as well as Burial uh, Beer Company have both met or exceeded their job targets of 160 and 20 jobs respectively. You can also see that the cluster in the middle, the New Belgium, GE, Jacob Holm, Linamar, have not met their targets. Uh, for many of those companies, the reason is that they still have a long way to go on their economic development agreements. If you look at New Belgium, they have until year 2028 to meet their commitments on jobs, so there's a little ways to go. Um, in the case of Jacob Home, we've worked with them extensively, and they're coming up slightly short on their targets. Uh, you can see that they're about nine jobs short, and uh, that's something that we've worked with them on for the past two years to make sure that they're only getting incentivized for those jobs that they create. Tim, question. Go ahead, on, uh, yeah. on Jacob Home, uh, you're showing their 95% on the funding. Uh, looks like they're uh, they're off nine jobs in 66, so it seems like that the uh, funding has outpaced the, the jobs. And I mean, it's just at a glance, so if you don't have any answers today, you just get back, you get back to me later. I do, and I can't work you through the math on the slide today, but uh, the way that incentive is structured, they get 50% for the capital investment, which they've exceeded right. uh, so extensively. Um, and the jobs, we've prorated that amount um, for the past two years. Uh, based on the amount of jobs they did create. So uh, that 95% is the, the compilation of those two calculations. So they went way over on their on their capital investment. That's correct. Thanks. Um, in section B, definitely want to focus on this a bit. Uh, in our community, we talk a lot about the cost of living. Um, average wages are one way of looking at that for these employers. Uh, as you'll see in section B, all of our employers are green. That means they're meeting or exceeding average wage targets that were, that were contractually written into their economic development agreements. Uh, using Ingalls as an example, they agreed to a $41,000 uh, average wage. They're sitting around $55,000. Uh, GE, $45,000, but sitting at $63,000 average wage. Uh, Linamar, $39,000, but sitting at $51,000, just to name a few. Uh, these wages, uh, I validate these myself. Uh, this is a process where they give us payroll uh, filings that they send to the state, and then we sort of calculate backwards to see what those wages actually are uh, to make sure that they're meeting the targets. Section C, uh, also very important, this is your capital investment. So this is your facilities, this is your business personal property, your really expensive equipment. Uh, you can see again uh, a spectrum here, a number that have hit their targets. To Commissioner Belcher's point, Jacob Holm, you know, their original commitment was $45.9 million, they're sitting at $79 million. So, you know, almost $30 million over their target. Uh, you can see uh, the same is true for Ingalls, $130 million total uh, compared to their $85 million target. Just want to give folks credit when they do exceed our targets. Those that are yellow, again, do have a good amount of time to meet those commitments, but do know that our staff will make sure that if they don't meet their commitments, uh, we will proceed accordingly based on the economic de development agreements requirements. It's a lot of data to take a look at. If there's any questions at that point, I'm glad to, to feel those questions. Now, I'll just make a comment on the other side too. It's, and if you look at but if you look at the, the information, is Lenamar is short on their jobs, and you know we've had a you know a lot of discussion the, the, this year on that. But um, and they're short on the capital. However, they uh, there has been only a third of that incentive. Given now, so and we're we're pretty excited about the upside there. But. That's correct. So this is a quick snapshot of your active economic development agreements and how they're performing uh, from a jobs, wage, and capital investment perspective. If you ever have any questions, I'm glad to provide additional detail. Uh, however, there's one other metric I want you to look at, and that's tax revenue. And so Clark mentioned this a uh, big a portion of the reason why we do economic development is to expand the tax base. Uh, so that is, you know, taxable value that generates revenue that can be used for county services and programs. Um, here, uh, again, presenting the same companies, there's two uh, columns on the far right. There's a cumulative tax for just Buncombe County. And so again, this is just your property tax. And then there's a, community, a cumulative tax, which includes all tax. So that's going to be your property tax, that's going to be your school tax, it's going to be your fire tax, uh, depending on where these companies reside in, in the county. So you can see, I'm not going to read this to you, um, since the public hearings for each of these respective companies, uh, these companies have paid in $13.2 million in Buncombe County tax and $21.7 million in total 
tax. That is to include school tax if they're in the city of Asheville, to include fire district tax, depending on where they reside. So I wanted to just quantify that uh, impact from a tax value perspective. This doesn't include sales tax or other payroll taxes that may be paid, so there are additional benefits, but wanted to stick to strictly the benefit that we see that comes into our general fund um, as a county government. The tagline, and then uh, we'll move on to next steps. Um, active projects on this list, if they meet all of their goals, will create 1,500 jobs in our community, $850 million in capital investment, and an estimated $2.3 million annually in property tax revenue. And so again, just wanted to sort of scope the efforts, show you sort of the return on investment, show you the performance of these companies, and show you the status of that money that you put into these economic development agreements. Are there any questions on any of this? Yeah. Got one. G is very short in many of them. So I believe we've got a problem with owning a building. We don't need to do that anymore. <coughs> because we're not getting much tax base off that bill. And, uh, you know, G's big, million some dollars, put that back up, please. Put that thing back up. Max? You are? We have the slides, please. I can barely see it from here, but it looks like G's one million, a few hundred thousand, and you look above it, New Belgium is two point some odd million, and you know I'm losing other numbers. But you know we got to figure out. You know we got to tell people the truth. That GE deal was screwed up. Big time when we go to the building. So we're not making anything really. I don't think it's good. Economic development is not good. We have one more slide and then uh, we'll conclude this presentation. So what's next? Uh, Mark, I'd ask you to, to join me for this. Uh, so moving forward in FY20, there's a few areas we'd like to focus on moving forward. Um, Mark and I are going to tag team this. Would you like to start on that? Sure. I, I think uh, so we're, we're thinking about what the next five years might hold from an economic development perspective. Think through population growth and through a number of other local and national challenges and opportunities, we expect to see continued growth uh, in a few high-value targets for this market, including aerospace, medical device uh, manufacturing, as well as corporate headquarters. I think there's sort of a broad understanding uh, that we have a, 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 a loud need for uh, greater employment opportunities uh, for that um, office, shared services, back office, technology office employer. Uh, so we're very aggressively creating strategies uh, to both grow those folks here um, and attract more of that kind of investment here. Um, I would also add, in terms of capacity development, we're at, uh, as I'm sure I've had uh, several discussions with, with all of you individually and, and sometimes in aggregate, around where we are from an unemployment perspective, hovering right at 3 to 3.2 percent. Um, we need to think seriously as a community about the capacity of our workforce, and the capacity of our sites and buildings if we want to continue to have jobs, uh, meaningful jobs and quality jobs in a diversified economy. Uh, so we are thinking about strategies that we can partner together with county and city staff in thinking about site development or perhaps future industrial park development, but also about workforce development and talent attraction strategies and talent retention strategies uh, that will create greater opportunities for our county residents uh, to participate. Uh, and their success here. Just a final couple areas, continued recruitment specifically in Enca Commerce Park as well as Black Mountain Commerce Park. Uh, some investments have been made there in that infrastructure, uh, not by the county but by our partners. So recruiting there. Also want to call out sort of recreational tourism as another area where we're recruiting new events to sort of uh, diversify our economy. <coughs> and our final but really important leg uh, relates to small business development. Uh, one of the programs that you have funded uh, through, through this board is the Mountain Community Capital, Capital Fund, which is a loan guarantee program, partnership with the City of Asheville. That's a leg of our strategy, but also, again, as Clark mentioned earlier, the Venture Asheville program, which really stresses uh, entrepreneurship. So with that said, we appreciate y'all's time. If there's any final questions or comments, we welcome them.
that was full. Get off the microphone. All right. Any other questions, comments? Just a brief thank you. It's actually it's very helpful to see all this presented. Alrighty, um, <clears throat> we do not have any public hearings. Uh, any? Also, no old business items. So, coming to new business items, the first item up is a resolution authorizing the financing for replacement of Sheriff Fleet vehicles. And Don Warren, Finance Director, will explain this item. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. So, pursuant to the uh, Sheriff Vehicle Replacement Project that was approved in the fiscal year 20 budget, um, we're seeking approval to enter into a financing agreement to purchase the vehicles. Uh, we went through a competitive solicitation and received 14 responses. Um, Bank of America Public Capital Corporation is the recommended lender for this project. Uh, we have, uh, excuse me, the uh, Total all in interest rate is 2.46%, which includes the budget amount of 1651174, as well as the uh, issuance costs that would be included with this uh, financing arrangement. And I would be happy to ask, answer any questions you may have about the financing or the RFP or anything else that you might do. Other questions? I just got a comment. We, I mean, we've had discussions about the three, the, uh, the, the three, PNC Bank, BB&T, and Bank of America. And the Bank of America's rate was a little higher. They're all they're all in rate, including the upfront charges and prepaid interest was was less. So, and that's a that's a five year payout. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve a resolution authorizing county staff to enter into a financing agreement with Bank of America Public Capital Court for, play, for replacement of share fleet vehicles in an amount not to exceed $1.7 million. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment on the motion? All right, further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you, Don. Thank you. Okay, next up is a resolution authorizing uh, the continuation of tax collection services for the towns of Black Mountain, Montreat, and Woodfin. And Tim Luck will be back to present the slide. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. No slides this evening, uh, but a uh, fairly simple presentation and request this evening. Uh, we've developed a draft resolution for your approval this evening. Uh, this resolution authorizes the chairman of the board or county manager to authorize uh, interlocal agreements with the uh, towns of Black Mountain, Montreat, and Woodfin to provide tax collection services. Um, as you are aware, the county has provided tax collection services for these municipalities since 2005. Uh, those agreements became a little stale, so we renegotiated those agreements with their respective boards, uh, and the boards have, those respective boards have approved each of these agreements. Um, at this time, we're asking for you to authorize the chairman and or county manager to execute these agreements um, so that they'll be, become fully official and move forward from there. So, pretty basic request. If there's any uh, general questions about the tax collection agreements, I'm glad to discuss those with you. Is there a motion to approve a resolution authorizing the chairman of the board or county manager to execute in respect of tax collection agreements associated with the towns of Black Mountain, Montreat, and Woodfin? So moved. Second. Any members of the public wish to comment on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thanks, Tim. Thank you. Okay, next up is consideration of a resolution endorsing medication-assisted treatment programs for opioid use disorders, and Commissioner Jacqueline beach Ferrara is going to get us started on this side. Yeah, good evening. Um, a few introductory remarks, and then Commissioner Edwards and I will read the resolution, uh, and then um, there will be opportunity for public comment and uh, to the board discussion. And, oh. um, I just want to begin by both thanking and um, Acknowledging many folks in the room and, and many who aren't here tonight, but who've worked 
uh, to bring us to a point where we're ready to vote as a Board of Commission to um, endorse the expansion of medication-assisted treatment programs at the uh, Buncombe County Detention Center, and more broadly endorse the use of medication-assisted treatment or MAP programs as a standard of care that's really um, critical to expand access to as our community continues to respond to the opiate crisis. Uh, so a special appreciation to staff at Buncombe County Sheriff's Office that have been spearheading this effort, to community partners at MAHEC and RHA, to state level partners at North Carolina uh, Department of Health and Human Services, including Deputy Secretary Cody Kinsley, uh, to county staff, including uh, Jan Shepard and Dr. Mullendore, who've been um, part of the uh, efforts to do work on this um, important project. And also a thank you to advocates in the room, folks in the recovery community, uh, and family and friends whose lives have been touched directly by the opiate crisis and who have um, become leaders in our community as we figure out how to respond, not just in short-term, but in long-term ways to this issue. Uh, the resolution that we're bringing forth tonight um, is about endorsing medication-assisted treatment as a standard of care that folks uh, deserve and ought to have access to. It's specifically about expanding that access at the detention center, recognizing that for folks who are incarcerated and who have opiate use disorder, the risks of overdose and accidental death by overdose in the days immediately after release as they enter the com our community again uh, spike to dangerously high levels. And that uh, during the time that folks are incarcerated, the opportunity for folks who feel ready to take the step to enter a MAT treatment program coupled with behavioral health support uh, and access to that continuum of care can be life-saving uh, and can also be transformative. Um, and this is certainly what we see and we hear from the front lines um, of providers in the field who are, who are providing that and seeing the ways that it's one piece of how people are uh, rebuilding their lives and their relationships and finding paths forward with hope um, and purpose. Uh, and it helps us, I, th I think, as a community understand that there are different kind of stories are possible than ones we've heard so often um, where there are tragic endings and very painful ones. Um, I know many folks on this commission uh, feel very passionately about how we're responding to the opiate crisis in our community and that many staff do. Uh, so many people in our community have been touched in different ways by this, um, myself included, and that's part of what motivates me around this issue. Um, and I just want to kind of take a moment to name that uh, and to name that every time we bring forth policy and have a discussion on this, it's another opportunity to break the silence and the stigma that too often surrounds addiction, uh, an opiate use disorder, and a chance to be telling a different kind of story. Um, so this, resu this resolution endorsing MAT treatment programs, endorsing the expansion of services in the, share in the detention center specifically, um, is part of a very broad set of commitments and strategies that inform the county's strategic work around responding to the opiate crisis. Um, and I look forward to more opportunities to um, be hearing from folks on the front lines of this issue about ways that counties can con the county can continue to step up, can continue to be a partner, and can continue to support these efforts. So um, with that, I think we'll go into reading the text of the resolution. All right. Whereas the United States opioid epidemic is a public health emergency with devastating consequences, including opioid misuse, addiction, community crime, transmission of communicable diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C, and overdose deaths. Whereas, in North Carolina, people are more likely to die of an overdose than a car crash. Overdoses are the leading cause of death for North Carolinians under age 50. In 2017, more than six people died each day in North Carolina from unintentional medication or drug overdoses. Whereas, the opioid crisis has been particularly severe in Western North Carolina with tragic impacts on people and families in Buncombe County. While our community has made significant strides, we still have much work to do. Whereas, fewer prescription opioids are being prescribed in Buncombe County, down from more than 17 million in 2016 to fewer than 14 million in 2017. However, overdoses are still on the rise. From 2015 to 2017, 163 people died in Buncombe County from unintentional opioid poisoning, according to state-level data, with deaths nearly tripling from 2015 to 2017, and emergency department visits up 30% from 2018 to 2019. 
Whereas, Buncombe County has established a strategic priority to stem the disease of opioid addiction through actions such as increasing public awareness and prevention, limiting the supply through industry and law enforcement action, and increasing access to treatment and harm reduction services. Whereas, Medication Assisted Treatment, MAT, is a standard of care treatment modality which combines behavioral therapy and medications as an evidence-based best practice to effectively treat opioid use disorder, reduce the risk of overdoses, reduce occurrences of relapse, and reduce the transmission of communicable diseases. Whereas, formerly incarcerated persons have been identified to have 40 times the risk of overdose. Whereas, detention facilities are in the front lines of this epidemic, and they are also in a unique position to initiate treatment in a controlled, safe environment, and to help people access a continuum of care, including mental health support and safe housing as they re-enter our community. Whereas, the Buncombe County Detention Center has a limited scope MAP program currently serving pregnant women. And whereas, the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office is developing a model for expanding access to MAT for opioid use disorder in the detention center. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Commissioners for the County of Buncombe as follows. That as part of our strategic priority of responding to the opiate crisis, this board endorses MAT as a strategy for responding to the opiate crisis and supports the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office expansion of the detention-based MAT program to provide increased access to effective evidence-based treatment. That this board supports a program structure that features a continuum of care, including screening, treatment, recovery education, case management, coordination with community-based providers, quality assurance, and sustainability. That this board believes initiatives such as this are most impactful when they are collaborative and thus supports working actively with state and local partners in expanding the MAP program, including through the use of state opioid, refund, uh, opioid response funds that will be used to pilot this initiative at the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office. That, that this resolution be effective upon its adoption this 20th day of August, 2019. I'm going through some health issues. Turn your mic on. on the opioids. Can you hear me? Is it working now? And it's the toughest thing that you can try. I promise you that. And it's just one little people that I'm on. It's an oxycodone, but it's an oxycodone. Now I'm off of it, been off of it four or five days. Uh, I was given it just for pain, but I've gone through some other stuff to make sure the pain's um, but I, I know there's people in here that the families have died from, you know, this, but when you're in pain, this is something that you need. But then you have to figure out, and I've only been on it 30 days, and now I've been off of it six days. Can we help people? To a point. But the people have to help themselves. And I want people to help themselves. I'm part of, I was part of an opioid deal here a year or so back, but I don't, I can't see how we can make this work in a jail. All we're doing is going to have to build another jail because we're going to put people in there. It's going to take time, a lot of time, to bring them out because of these, these pills. The doctors are giving them, you know, I took them, but uh, we need another place to be able to put the people besides in jail. And that is my issue is jailing people, then figuring out how to fix a problem that they have. I have a problem that I go to my doctors for. And I figured out that I couldn't make it work in that own way and I had to make my own decision. I made my own decision to stop using any oxycodone or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'll take time off and ibuprofen now. But I can show you the little pill in my pocket, it'll knock you down. And I only used half of it. So I understand these families now, the problems that they've had, and it sucks. I, can, I promise you that. But how much can we totally put into this, this total project? 
it's a, resolutions are just a resolution. That this is what somebody wants to do. Then it, then it costs the taxpayers money to do it to try to make sure something's done. We're getting ready to vote on other stuff. But by the time we get through with this issue, we'll end up, the sheriff will be wanting a new jail because half the people he's got over is going to be on drugs. And I don't want anybody to be on not one drug, especially if they don't have any problems. You know, if I didn't have a problem, I sure wouldn't be on them. And I'm trying my best to get away from them. And I'm done, I'm doing, I'm going to. I've done it. But there's so many things that happened during that period in your health that you just, it, it's, it's really tough. But the uh, main thing is very good writing, very good issue. But we've gone through this before. There's a lady I know, and her son, you know, died at AB Tech. She went to our meetings over a year ago with Ellen Frost and myself. Hmm? She's here this evening. She's here with us, that's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I appreciate you coming. But you had it tough. Everybody's got it tough. And there's ways that things can happen. But we can't depend on the sheriff's department to be the nurses for the drug people that are on drugs. So, um, I don't know what to say. I mean, I'll, I'll vote. It's just a resolution I'll vote. But when it starts coming around and nothing's really happening and the sheriff comes over here and says, well, I need a new jail because you know, it's taking up all this room. We don't have a lot of room anyway. So I guess we just need to get rid of the federal prisoners and you know, get rid of that money and then we have room <laughs> to put people in there. I love this county. I love the people. And I've done everything I can to try to help. But we've come up with so many resolutions and giving money away and doing this and doing that in the last five months. I don't get it. I mean, I've been up here for six years, seven years. I just don't get it. We come up with more items that we can just say, here's the money. Well, I do want to put money into it, but I want to put it into it a different way. We've got to help. There's not just one resolution going to make this work. And, you know, some people may get mad at me for it. I'm sorry if you do. But I understand where these people are. That's the one thing I have. I understand where they're at. And they've been going on for six months now. So, uh, I want God to take care of all the people that have these problems including myself, and get away from it. <clears throat> but I just can't see doing resolution after resolution after resolution. Because we come up with something new, do a resolution to do homeless shelters, do resolutions to do this, do resolutions to do that, do resolutions to send to Raleigh on HB 370. I'm tired of resolutions. I want to see facts happen. That's what I set up here for, is facts for the people that this county. And that's the, the thing that I think about. And I look at the dollars and cents that we have, and I try to look at the budget, and I try to look at every dollar and cent everybody out here has to put into the budget. You know, do we have to go up on the taxes to be able to take care of these people? Who knows? And I know I'm probably saying a lot of things that, you know, they've, they've done a good resolution, put it together. But, I, you know, I'm in between on this one. I want to help, but I can't see, you know. And I wanted to help before. We went to four different events. Didn't have enough people to show up to talk about. AB Tech, Fairview, uh, Black Mountain, and Weaverville. But I just wanted it to work. And I wanted it to work then, and I wanted it to work today. But this is not the way it's going to be working. We cannot turn our jails into hospitals for drug addicts. Now, if you want to build a building to take them and try to help them, that would probably be something else. You know, our officers work really hard to try to take care of us, all of us, all of us. And we, right now we're going through a lot of homeless stuff, we're going through a lot of different stuff, and it's not going to get better until we can figure out how to fix some of that. So, I will vote for this. 
This will be the last resolution. Anything like it. But God knows that our people need help. But it's not a thing of man or whatever you want to call it for the church department. It's a thing for the people, the families, to get a hold of the church department to try to figure out what's going on. But we can't we just can't make our jail over there a place and then the sheriffs, you know, we we pay these guys not that decent enough money. And they're gonna to have to figure out how to listen to, to what to do in certain ways. Now, you know, we're just seven people sitting up here. I just wanna say I wanna help the people. And I've talked too long already. And I brought too much up already. Is, I want to thank everybody in this county for what they tried to do. And, uh, and God's, you know, I hope He helps everybody to sit here that their families had problems, deaths, or just going through the problems. Because we've all got things in our families that we've gone through. Not just what I'm going through, but what other people's gone through. So, uh, Let's put it up for a vote, and I'll vote for it. Great, let's go ahead and Any other commissioners who need to up, so comment on the resolution? You know, in listening to Commissioner Fry, it reminds me of a political science course that I took in college on the state and local government. And one of the things that was pointed out in there is one of the ways that we govern in a democracy is through re resolutions. And I think that's what we are doing here tonight. The other is, too, sure it's seven of us here, but the seven of us represent the 260,000 constituents or residents in Buncombe County, and that's why they elected us to do this job. Now, when we look at this resolution, which I think is an excellent resolution, and it's not all about the jails, it's about attacking the opioid problem. And this is just one arrow in our quiver, quiver of, of attacking it. You know, and when you look at people in the jails who have an opioid problem, they're not there just because of the opioid problem. They're there because they're broken laws. And that's why they're in jail. But if we're going to keep them out, we've got to start with that segment of our population in the jails, because I think that's what will prevent them, hopefully, from going back to jails and prevent us from spending more taxpayers' money on the opioid problem. Because if we bury our heads in the sand, folks, with this problem, it's just going to cost us more money. And we've got to start somewhere to correct the problem. And that's why I think we need this resolution. That's why I'm going to vote for it. And I'll vote for others in the future because we will need them if we're going to successfully attack this problem. And, you know, maybe what I've learned over the years and my idea of how we run a democracy is different from the way it should be, but I don't think it is. But I will not stop writing resolutions, supporting them, because that's the way we govern folks, and that's the way it should be. Thanks. Any other commissioners? We're going to take public comment on the motion just a minute. I would like to first thank Commissioner Beach Ferrara for including me in the first meetings regarding medical assistant treatment. Um, really dug in and learned a lot. And the reason that I was able to support this is the research that I did on my own and also through um, Mrs. Seaman, who has met with me numerous times to share her story and the work that she's doing. But Matt is considered the gold standard of treatment. And I think it helps us really reframe how we approach addiction, that it's a medical condition and we view it as a disease. And I think the closer that we can get to really addressing addiction as a disease, we can start to to help our folks within Buncombe County that are truly in need of, of treatment so that we can get past this crisis. So I am really pleased to support this. And um, just again, thank you, Commissioner Beach for, for including me and letting me dig in on my own to learn more. Thank you. Great. Uh, 
So I have a question, Chairman. Is, is it okay if it be very short? Is it okay if I ask the uh, uh, sheriff a question regarding this? Is that, is that appropriate? Um, it would. Yeah. Why don't we, let me make a suggestion. Um, why don't we take public comment, and then if you'd like to ask the sheriff to a question, sure. you, you can do that. So All right, we'll take space to do that. Sure. Thanks. All right, why don't we go ahead and take public comment on, we have a, a motion to approve the resolution, and uh, we'll go ahead. I'm sorry. There has not been a motion made yet. Is there someone who'd like to make a motion? So moved. All right, thank you. In my mind, that had already happened. Okay. Okay, we've got a motion in a second. Uh, support the resolution. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment on this proposal? Mr. Yellow. Thank you, Mike, for making your personal telling your personal story. But when you get your side cut from up here to down here and you put another man's kidney in, you guess what they hand you? Bottle of pills. Now I'll have to do something with it, because if I say this on the air and there's a dope head out there hears me, they'll break into my house because that bottle's still sitting in my medicine closet. I took one. That's what you're talking about, Mike. It's awareness. And the resolution is just a bunch of words. That's all it is. I talked to the young man out front a while ago, that's been elected to go to the County Commission, County Commissioner Association. And I told him a phrase, and I'm telling you this phrase. We don't suffer from a lack of knowledge. We suffer from a lack of application of knowledge. When it comes to stormwater runoff, it comes to garbage, when it comes to opioid. Remember what I said. It's what you're talking about, Mike. This resolution is not going to do a hill of beans if the people, the people, not you seven, but the people don't take it as a personal goal and start talking about it. And some of the people that's listening to my voice out there and those doctors that's writing these prescriptions, what should you do to your doctor that writes you a prescription and hands you a big bottle of pills? Should you tell him I ain't gonna take all of them? Or that's too many? That's what we gotta do. And now we've got to put words and actions behind that resolution. Resolution is not going to do a thing. Thank you, Mike, for making it personal. Because it is personal. Anybody back there suck, it's personal. Okay? It's there. And it's up to them. And I think we fail to look at one of the greatest cures in the world. We are a spiritual being. You don't address that spirit side, you're never going to solve your problems. All right, anyone else? Yes, sir. And please uh, share your name, uh, and you'll have three minutes for comment. And when the red button goes off, your time is up. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sujin Shukla. <clears throat> I'm a family doctor at NAAC, and previously I was at Winches, also an Asheville resident. I am an expert in opioid use disorder. I prescribe buprenorphine. And years ago, I was a big prescriber of oxycodone because that's what we did and that's what I was taught. Um, so I myself have evolved in how I view this problem. And I absolutely acknowledge that there are certain situations where opioids are needed. And there are many situations where opioids are inappropriately given. But I have dealt deep in this issue. I work with NAHIC with a team where we educate providers across the state as well as doctors in training on opioid use disorder, as well as safe prescribing of opioids for pain conditions. And so I can state some facts, since that's what we're looking for. So some facts are that medication for opioid use disorder decreases death very quickly, like within a day, immediately. It works. It works the longer you're on it. It also reduces hospitalization, ER visits. It reduces non-fatal overdose. It reduces HIV and Hep C transmission. 
It also pays for itself in conjunction with behavioral health therapies and harm reduction services. Some states have estimated for every dollar spent on these services saves four to seven dollars. Those dollars are saved because of criminal justice system costs, the cost of crimes themselves, as well as health care costs. The patients I've taken care of were insured patients, Medicare patients, Medicaid patients, uninsured patients. I've taken care of rich people and poor people. I've taken care of old and young, and anyone can be affected. I've had patients who also have had transplants and other severe medical conditions that required opioids, and despite their willpower, they became addicted and developed an opioid use disorder. They didn't will it, they weren't abusing it, it just happened. It's a little bit like cigarettes. If you smoke a few cigarettes, you're gonna be addicted to cigarettes. This is my belief, and it's also been my first-hand experience, and it's also supported by research. Any questions? I'm not allowed, I don't know if I'm allowed to have questions. <laughs> we, don't, we don't ask, thank you very okay. much. Okay. So if we get questions, we'll, we'll call it. Um, yes, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, so you mentioned Chairman Newman and Commissioners. My name is Ann Seaman and I live in Montreat. I'd like to take this opportunity to urge you to all embrace Sheriff Miller's introduction of medication-assisted treatment for those suffering from opioid dependency in his care. Many law enforcement leaders now provide opioid substitution medications in their detention facilities. This enlightened approach eliminates unnecessary suffering and it produces better outcomes. By embracing medically sound approaches that treat opioid dependency, we are treating our fellow citizens as human beings. However, we are not just being compassionate. We are also being fiscally responsible. Each EMS call and transport, each emergency room visit, and each detention center stay costs us tax dollars and costs us, most importantly, the loss of a productive citizen. This cycle repeats itself over and over again for that opioid dependent individual until they are dead. Each poisoning death creates emotional distress for families. If the deceased was a parent, the trauma of that loss is visited upon their minor children. Children who experience the death of a parent have a much higher likelihood of becoming substance dependent themselves. It's a vicious cycle. Medications work. In order to function, to not be in an agitated or unsettled state, the opioid dependent in our care should be offered medication. Without the crushing sickness that accompanies opioid withdrawal, detainees have the chance to rationally deal with the circumstances that put them into detention. Tobacco smokers who choose to quit are routinely treated with medications to help them transition. Medications alleviate symptoms associated with sudden absence of nicotine by simply replacing the smoked tobacco with a less toxic, safer chemical. <coughs> tobacco smoking is known to be harmful. Opioids are known to be harmful. I would argue that opioids, and particularly illicit fentanyl, are just as harmful, not just harmful, but they are deadly. So using opioid replacement medications should be a no-brainer. It is my belief that a society is judged by how it treats its most vulnerable citizens. Thanks to Sheriff Miller, thank you, Sheriff, we will be providing humane solu solutions to a population most impacted by the opioid epidemic. This will help those in detention experience a healthier way to deal with their dependency and put them on the path to recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then you can uh, go after her. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Laura Wolf. I'm a family medicine physician. I work in Cherokee at the reservation, but I live in Montreat as much as possible. And I just wanted to support your um, resolution and just commend you for the um, really progressive thinking in. in fighting the opioid crisis. I've been writing Suboxone for five years and 
was fortunate enough to work with a group at Cherokee and their Suboxone program that is in long-term recovery. So I write Suboxone, or well, I wrote Suboxone for people who had been um, in recovery, you know, out of drug use for two years, four years, six years, eight years. I've had patients um, that are still using a little small dose of Suboxone because they're so afraid that if they do quit, um, it's almost like giving them a placebo, but they're afraid if they do quit, they'll relapse. And so they really want this to keep them um, where they need to be. And I would have to agree with all of the commissioners saying it's probably not going to solve the problem, but it is something, and, and you have to do something, and you have to start somewhere. I think um, starting in the jail is a good opportunity because you literally have a captive audience. You have a lot of um, men and women there that do are there because of their um, addictions and bad choices. And if you start them on the medically assisted treatment with the behavioral health therapy, it would be a start um, in their recovery process. And then hopefully there would be other members of the community. Um, there will need to be other members of the community that come alongside after the jail and continue that. Um, program of recovery, but I think it's a really good place to start, and I just, I'm, I'm very um, thankful to all of you for taking responsibility for the, um, the opioid crisis. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gail Juhas and I live in Weaverville. I'd like to talk about withdrawal from opioid addiction. Um, I have a little bit different point of view in that I had an experience myself and uh, it's made me feel very strongly about trying to help addicts that are going through withdrawal and, and addiction problems. So I, I feel very compassionate towards people who are suffering because withdrawal from uh, the opioids is not really talked about very much, what is really going on for people and what they're experiencing. But I have to say, it's a personal hell. It's so painful that it's difficult to describe what it's like. It's something your brain does to you because of the chemicals that have been in there for a while. Not everybody goes through this, but some people do, and nobody should have to go through it without support and without medical help. There is medical help available. For me, I experienced a very bad leg injury, uh, multiple surgeries, long rehab, I was on pain meds for a long time and decided I didn't want to take them anymore. I didn't need them anymore. But the process I had to go through to get off of the medication was horrendous. And I finally was able to get help when I was sent to a drug detox unit in a hospital where I was on a, in a locked unit for a week. I was given Suboxone there, which was like uh, amazing because after a few days I was better. I was able to eat. Um, my brain started to clear. I wasn't crying all the time. I f just felt better and in a week I was ready to go home. I mean nobody should have to go through that that awful experience when there is medical help available. It's just really really hard to get and I wish you all could pass a resolution that any doctor that prescribes th these opioid medications would be responsible to follow up with their patients to make sure they safely get off the medication. That should be part of general medical care. At any rate, I feel much more compassionate now for anybody who's going through this, it's a whole different way of looking at it. And 
it changes your mindset. Gail, thank you so much. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Seeler. Thank you all. Um, my name is Mark Seiler. I am a pastor at Haywood Street Congregation, and I'm just grateful for everybody that has brought this forward. Um, I'm here honestly because I'm really tired of doing memorial services for people um, who I've come to know and admire who are caught up in this epidemic. I have also learned and seen back to your comment about applying knowledge, I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, and I have learned through my community the power of medical assisted treatment to really support the shift from opioid dependence to a life. Uh, we have members of our staff, core members of our staff who utilize MAT, uh, are a key part of our ministry and work that we do. Uh, I've watched folks caught in the depths of that epidemic. Um, find their way into medical assistant treatment and, and rebuild their lives in extraordinary ways. Um, I think most folks know we are a church that is really trying to do church and community with folks who are affected by homelessness and mental illness um, and addiction. We know this epidemic is touching every facet of our society, but, but the incidence of overdose is, is much higher among our community. Because I pastor that kind of church, I'm here at the jail at least once or twice a week, visiting members of my community. And prior to coming to Haywood Street, I was a prison chaplain in Marion for a number of years, and I firmly, I've seen the power of incarceration being a moment for folks to reset and return to themselves. And I see, and I know, I've witnessed it, the medical assistant treatment can be a powerful part of that. I'm very grateful for our leadership in the jail, our sheriff and Sarah Regala, and all those that are providing opportunities for incarceration to not just be a horrible experience, but a new opportunity. And it's just clear as it can be the medical assisted treatment would be a powerful addition to what's already happening in our jail for that purpose. So thank you all for your leadership. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay, thank, thank you all. We took time to come out and comment on this, this issue. All right, bringing this back to the board. Further discussion? Uh, any um, commissioners who have not yet spoken on the matter? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a question. I didn't want to leave the sheriff in, in uh, suspense. I really don't, don't necessarily have to ask the question now, but you come on, I'm going to ask it in here. Um, I don't want you. I don't want you going home wondering what what was Belcher wanting to ask me tonight. Uh, yeah, you'd have called me, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's very simple, Sheriff. Um, I just want to know if this uh, uh, this program, this resolution that you, if you and your department um, recommend it tonight, that's the only question I have for you. Good evening. But to answer your question is yes. Uh, I, I really believe that uh, I've told everyone that it's time for us to do something different. We just can't arrest our way out of this. And I've also said very adamant that I think this is the time when people are the most sober while they're incarcerated. And this is the chance to get them to you know, uh, take a chance. As you said, take a chance on this, and this is the time to do it. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Sheriff. I've just got a couple of comments, and you know, I'd say this this resolution is uh, uh, um, one that uh, one of the, one of the dangers of having a lot of resolutions. You've heard a little bit of conversation about that. Is that if 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 you have a lot of them and they're personal and political in nature, then they dilute, they tend to dilute uh, a resolution like this, which is uh, I think is is important. I think uh, every commissioner up here has been been touched by by this. Uh, um, Terrible. Um, you know, I don't know what you call it. It's epidemic. You call it epidemic, but that's not a real. It's not much of a personal word. Word, but uh, it's touched children and grandchildren, and church members, and pastors, and and just people in my life. And so, if we can, uh, if we can do a little, uh, and it can be administered properly through the uh, through the sheriff's department, and uh, this is uh, this is not about seven people telling y'all 
what we want to uh, want you to do, or that, or us. And I'm not taking that any way, not taking away from the, the two commissioners that put this forward, because I know their hearts, so I know that's not what they're trying to do. Um, it's such a big problem, I think we can do a lot. Now, I, um, I have witnessed, uh, Pastor, where's your hand at? Wait at me. Okay. Pastor, I have, I, I have also witnessed those that have, um, have been able to free themselves um, physically and spiritually from this evil uh, addiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you, we got to kick walls down to make this happen. Got to kick the walls down between government and, and the church. We got to kick walls down in between departments in the, in the county. And we got to do that. So, uh, but it would challenge us, you know, going forward that we'd be very serious about as. Uh, Commissioner uh, Whiteside said, "Part of what we do is is resolutions. We don't we don't pass laws. You know, we en we enact things by resolution just to be careful going forward. This is a really good resolution. I support it. I'll pray for the people involved, uh, including you, Sheriff. And so, uh, hopefully, we'll see some we'll see some we'll see some good come from it. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah. yeah, just briefly in, in, in the closing remarks I'll make, I want to thank the people who came this evening to share your stories and experiences, which help um, us understand in such immediate ways what's at stake. Um, also just want to take a second to, to reiterate and name again that this, this uh, resolution is about endorsing uh, Matt, but it's also about sort of a part of a much broader network of strategies and interventions that the county is involved with in responding to the opiate crisis including uh, the syringe services program, which launched just last week, um, including efforts around harm reduction, um, and including uh, very strong collaborations across the community. So I, I want to um, I want to make note of that. And, and another thing I want to lift up that I think has been embedded in a lot of what people have shared is um, Matt is life-saving. The data is there. The stories are there. Um, there's something else that we hear a lot that's life-saving also, which is when people know that they're part of a community that loves them and sees them and values them. Um, and that's, for me, part of why I think it's so important we do keep talking about this issue um, in every kind of community setting. Um, and um, if, if, if one small piece of what we can bring into our community's response is trying to shift the way we talk about addiction, and trying to shift the way we respond and saying, no, we're not going to build a new jail in Buncombe County. We're going to respond to the mental health issues and needs that exist. We're going to um, develop the kind of innovative responses that actually speak to what's going on in people's lives. Um, so, so, so that's part of the motivation is um, how we create a community where everyone knows they have a place, they're loved, they belong, and they will be cared for, um, which I think is what we'd all want for those we love most dearly and what we all want for everyone in our community. And this is one, one piece of a very big puzzle that goes into doing that. But thank you to everyone who's spoken. Thank you for the engaged conversation. I always appreciate when we get to dig into an issue that matters a lot. So thank you to everyone on commission for sharing your thoughts and perspectives. All right. Commissioner Presley, you don't give a comment? Uh, all right, great. Um, <clears throat> uh, before we go, I'd just like to um, just make a brief comment. You know, sometimes we do adopt resolutions that are sort of primarily symbolic in nature. They might express the sentiments of the commission, but in some cases they might be directed towards other um, agencies or other levels of government that have more direct responsibility or the ability to affect the issue directly. Uh, this is not that kind of resolution. This is a resolution that is uh, about us taking really direct action here in our community to implement a specific program that is entirely within our control to implement. It, it takes the leadership of the Sheriff's Department uh, to do this, uh, but the Buncombe County is responsible for the financial uh, investments in the operations of our detention center. So I think it takes the, the partnerships between the county and the Sheriff and, and other partners to move forward a specific initiative like this. So, and it gives our staff a very specific, clear direction that we are committed to this and we want to see it implemented in the most effective ways. So this is not a symbolic resolution, this is a resolution about implementing a really important set of initiatives to, uh, to make the most, uh, most important of, of uh, differences in uh, one of the most important issues facing our community. So I want to thank everyone who's helped uh, bring us to this point and uh, look forward to uh, monitoring it as it, moves, as it moves ahead. 
All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you all again. We're going to take a five minute break. Right back. Please with us to uh, take your seats, please. Let me get started again. All right, uh, commissioners. The next item is the FY 2020 budget amendment related to the school capital commission funding for radio equipment for city and county schools. And uh, Jennifer's here to talk to us about this item. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, we do have two budget amendment requests um, bringing forward to you today. And the first one is in reference to the school capital fund. Uh, at the November 20th, 2018 Board of Commissioners meeting, the board voted um, to approve $1,935,000 um, at the recommendation of the School Capital Fund Commission for installation of bi-directional and distributed antenna systems. Um, it was identified that um, this was uh, needed to enhance public safety um, for our school systems. After receiving the formal bids, an additional $291,825 is needed to complete the project. Uh, we are coming forward today to request approval for the additional $291,825 for this project. Um, this request has been resubmitted and approved by the School Capital Fund Commission, and the um, source of funding, uh, would, we would plan for that to be debt proceeds which is supported with Article 39 tax revenue dollars. Um, again, a reminder that those are dollars that are legally committed to fund school capital. Um, so that is our request of you this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Are right, commissioners, are there any questions or is there a motion to approve? First, let's um, discuss the budget amendment for the School Capital Commission funding for the telecommunications radio equipment improvements for the City and County Schools. Yeah, Chair, and I got a comment. Uh, you and I serve on that board, and we've, uh, you know, we're privy to more information than the rest of the board. But we've got uh, a gentleman with us that can uh, give us uh, give us more information. I'd like to ask him to come up and tell us why there there's a there's a difference in the type of snapshot that was done initially. And uh, why it um, why today it's 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 running more, and as um, I think the the information that he provided us at the meeting was uh, was uh, was good and should be heard by the rest of the commission. So, thank you. Sure. I'll turn that over to Vance Bell, who is with Buncombe County's Information Technology. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Commissioners. Good evening. So, about a year ago, we went before uh, the School Capital Fund Commission. Uh, with some anecdotal information based on SRO information in the schools. We've been, been receiving comments from them, hey, we're not getting good radio coverage, things like that. So um, that was all anecdotal, and at the time it was 20 of the 42 county schools at the time, they reported that they had limited or no coverage, and again, that was anecdotal. Part of that request in that uh, School Capital Fund Commission meeting was to appropriate money for an actual, um, more detailed study where we had engineers come in with equipment, record the actual signal levels of those of the radio uh, systems in there. Um, and it came back and it was actually um, significantly worse than, than we anticipated. So that's, that's the reason for this, this additional money. <clears throat> On the scale of things, again, we said 20 schools and we had budgeted 1.9 million. It's more in the range of 40 something schools and it's an additional $200,000 to, to close that gap. So per school, it's actually a little less per school um, overall, hope that helps. Well, it, it, it does. Simply, you're uh, you know you might go in in a corner. I mean, this covers every corner, every spot, in every school. That's correct. Well, so we're we're meeting. There was a, there was a new code that was issued in 2018 um, by the state. It's a fire code that 95% of all buildings have to have adequate coverage 
we're, we're adopting that particular code so we make sure we, we're doing it the right way. Any new construction has to have that anyhow. That is correct. So any new schools that are built would have to adhere to that new code. The concern was these are older schools and they, they would not be able to communicate adequately if we don't do this. So it's not something we're going to have to come back and revisit in the future. In That's, correct. Okay. That's correct. That's just one, <clears throat> one other comment I would share that I found particularly, you know, it's just sort of learning about the technology and the issue and the meeting. You know, and it's not a dynamic where if uh, folks outside the building are trying to talk to law enforcement or other personnel inside the building that the, you know, that the signal is more faint or it's harder to hear. It's more of like a, it's an on-off system. So there are just many places in the school systems right now that if law enforcement is trying to talk to law enforcement or other uh, emergency responders who are inside the building, they literally cannot talk to each other. So that's uh, obviously a big concern in uh, all kinds of different situations, but especially you know any kind of situation where schools are facing some kind of you know urgent law enforcement matter, correct, or public safety matter. So I have one question: uh, Will this cover now every school in both school districts in the county? That's correct. So we uh, we did city and county schools. That's correct. Good. If I missed. Yeah. Sorry. Thank, thanks for being here. Any, any other questions? All right, is there a motion to approve uh, the budget amendment for the radio equipment? Any members of the public wish to comment on the motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board. I, uh, equipment is one thing, but I've not heard anybody say anything about who's going to maintain it and how long they got to do it, you know? I mean, if, if you're going to get equipment, it's got to be maintained and just put the equipment in there. I'd like to know a little more about the contract. Is there a contract in this for the maintenance of this stuff that they're putting in? We're talking about a lot of money here. Uh, do you understand my question? Any other members of the public who have any comments? Right, great. Um, would you like to respond to what's the sure. useful life of the equipment? Any observations on maintenance? Absolutely. So that's a great question. Um, we, the, the expected lifespan of these systems are about 20 years. And in the bid process, we asked them to include the first two years of equipment and maintenance so that the schools wouldn't have to budget for it and they would have some ramp up time. So first two years are covered, and then the schools know they have to pick it up after that. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? For our second budget amendment uh, request for this evening, um, it is in reference to the general fund. Um, so AB Tech um, Community College had come forward with a request for additional funding in support of their operations to the county manager on August 6th. After review and consideration, their recommendation to allocate additional funding um, in a total of amount of $300,000 um, is our request this evening. Uh, $250,000 of that um, is dollars that were previously being paid from state funds for communications. Um, the, that is not a state allowable um, cost. Therefore, those would be dollars that we would recommend to be paid out of county funds. With an additional $50,000 request um, to cover a one per, an anticipated 1% salary increase in association with um, county funded positions for AB Tech. The funding source for that, um, it would not require any additional uh, general fund dollars. Our request would be to transfer $300,000 um, from Public Safety Training Center to the AB Tech Cost Center for Education. Um, we um, have spoken with the Public Safety Training staff and do believe that um, this would be doable in the fiscal year uh, 2020 cycle. All right, thank you. All right, commissioners, any questions or comments or a motion? All right, there's a motion in the second to approve the recommendation of $250,000 and an additional $50,000 for a total of $300,000. Uh, 
uh, for AB tax operations for this budget cycle. Uh, I want to acknowledge we've got President Dennis King and Chief Financial Officer Dirk Wilmot with us. Thank you both for being here uh, this evening. We also had a, a discussion about this issue at our pre-meeting earlier today. I appreciate you both being at that as well and answering some of the questions um, that commissioners had. Um, are there any members of the public who wish to comment on the motion? <clears throat> okay. Um, I do have a question uh, that I'd like to ask um, one of our friends from AB Tech. Um, so I don't know who might want to field it. I basically, I just wanted to ask for, um, you know, we had some, some good discussion about this issue earlier today, and um, you commented on how AB Tech has been looking at different, you know, ways to manage the budget this year, as all the agencies do. And so I just wanted to ask, um, for you to comment on if we if this motion is approved tonight for the additional three hundred thousand dollars with some of the other um, budget management um, ideas that you've been looking at, what what position is this going to place AB Tech in for this budget budget cycle? So just just your feedback on the the recommended funding level from the county manager. Well, I think it's going to be adequate now. Um, we uh, we have um, taken a look at the budget a second time. Uh, earlier we removed. I want to say it was about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars from our original request, and uh, we took a second look at it, and uh, now we have identified about two hundred and forty thousand dollars worth of additional cuts that we feel we can take from the budget, and so with the three hundred thousand which uh, is in this uh, motion, uh, it's my belief that we will have the budget balanced for the entire fiscal year. Okay. Um, and could you share any more details in just in terms of, you know, what are some of the steps the college is looking at um, in terms of helping to bridge that gap that was identified? What are some of the, um, you know, some of the strategies that are being pursued and what are some of the things that you, you feel like you may not need to do if the 300000 is approved? Um, well, I think everything that's on our list will have to be done to close the gap entirely. Remember the gap we were talking about was 500000 and so, um, with the 300 here, we still have got a gap that we're taking care of. Uh, we have frozen two positions, which will be um, a little bit over $100,000 counting the benefit package for those uh, positions. When I say frozen, what I mean is they are still on the books and we will fill them as soon as uh, the budget uh, handles it. We also uh, are taking a hard look at our telecommunications system. Uh, we've, we have um, like all, like all cell phones, they proliferated, and we have a great number of cell phones on campus uh, which are not being utilized uh, or are being utilized in a, by someone who perhaps doesn't really need it. And so we expect to be able to take uh, a large number of those off the table. I believe, I believe the number was in the vicinity of $20,000, but I think we're going to be able to get more of that. We'll uh, get a good look at that number tomorrow. Those are two of the things that come to my mind as, as uh, cuts of our 250000 There will also be savings on some positions uh, that will be filled when the incumbent leaves, the salary goes down typically, and uh, we are anticipating some of that. Thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, any questions? We've got President King this. Maybe I misunderstood early today. I thought you said, maybe I misunderstood you, Dennis, I'll be honest, but I thought you said you had frozen one, but it was two positions. No, it's two positions, yes. One we, one we spent a great deal of time talking about right. and the uh, ramifications of doing that, uh, and of course there was some uh, concern, I think, to make sure that we uh, keep up preventative maintenance with right. that position, etc. cetera. Uh, but yes, there are two positions that we have frozen. All right. Thank you for being with us. And uh, if there's any other questions, um, all right. And, and there were no other members of the public who wished to comment. So uh, further discussion from the board. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, it's approved. Thank you. Okay, we have um, board appointments, and the first is the historic resources. Commission.
I'd like to nominate Stephanie West. Second. Second. Okay. Are there any other um, of the applicants who folks wish to speak for or nominate? Okay. Uh, all in favor of Stephanie West, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. And we also have Health and Human Services Board a reappointment. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, we now come to general public comment. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment? Understand that the discussion occurred today to move public comments at the beginning of the meeting. And I would implore that you don't do that because if you do that, then we don't know what you've said during the meeting and we can't give you our thoughts on that because you don't care about our thoughts anyway. But I think you need to leave public comment at the end of the meeting and I will still thank you, Brownie, for taking public comment on the things that you vote on and I hope you continue to do that, but I think it needs to stay at the end of the meeting. I don't think we got any money problems. I'm hearing this as a citizen. For every dollar we spend on opioids, we get 47 back. For every dollar we spend on economic development, we get 90 back. Now, your economic development presentation tonight was great. I like that. Because what did he do? He showed money that was supposed to go, money had gone, and what percent had gone. And I would like to you folks to consider that anybody comes before you and asks for money, it has to be on a line item in the budget, right? So if it's going to be on that line item, you have to do the same thing. Money in the budget, how much is being asked here, and if it's given, this is what's going to be left. All you got to do is do that little chart. Because I know you fill out a piece of paper that says what's it going to do and how good it is. That will help us to understand what's going on. Because when I looked at the economic development, I'm all for it, just like we're all for education, we're all for opioids, we're all for everything. But if you look at that economic development, that 20 some million dollars over X number of years took the tax revenue from 15,000 median priced homes in Buncombe County. Every million dollars you give out takes the tax revenue from a median price house, 641 of them. See, Jerry Rice said one time here, and got made Wanda Green so mad she couldn't stand it. F liars figure, but figures never lie. You can present a rosy picture, but you got to dig deep into it. That's why I encourage you to consider what I said about a line item for the budget. How much is in that budget? Because all that money that's not been given out in economic development, in the future, where is it going to come from? You guys. Actually, not you guys. All of us. The taxpayers. So we need to know, and you all need to know that it's there when you give away 50000 or 60000 or 100000 or $2 million. And if I time it just right, I can get every word in that I wanted to tell you before the buzzer. Okay. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member of the board. Earlier today, I was asked about public coming on, about what I liked about it or anything that I was do differently if moved up front or at the rear. Well, I said it didn't matter. Well, it does matter. Because you didn't ask me the other question that the chairman had on his uh, email to you all. Uh, my concern is it don't matter if it's the front or the rear, but it does matter to me if you take it away from us not being able to talk on your voting pieces of legislation you got. Because if you do that, you've screwed the public. And we ain't being able to hear your conversation and being able to talk about it 
So therefore, we ain't knowledgeable about what all the pieces are, just like these pre-meetings. You can sit and blast all out here and tell a big story and you hear a lot of good information, but when you get up here, you burn out and you don't talk about nothing. The public don't hear. So I'm, I'm a little PO'd about that because you need to tell a constituent what you're doing, not, not down there in the pre-meeting. Uh, so on the, on, on the thing that if you're going to vote on the public comment sector, make sure that, uh, that we're going to get to speak on the voted items. If you don't, you're wasting your time for public comment. But you're not giving the public an opportunity to hear it before you talk about it. This is the same old story that's been done for years. It's always about just what Don said. You don't want to listen for the most of you. I would say all of you. You don't want to hear the public. But the public is important. Even if it's just me and Don, we're important. Thank you. We are the public. <laughs> Anyone else? All right. Got a couple of announcements. On September 3rd at 3 p.m., the county commissioners will hold their pre meeting at Tudor College Street, room 326, here in downtown Asheville, followed at 5 p.m. by the regular meeting here in College, in Tudor College Street, room 326. Uh, we do have a closed session this evening uh, on two items. And Ms. Hockaday, will you tell us what they are? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3, um, we have a matter to consult with an attorney retained by the public um, body regarding RAB Builders LLC versus Buncombe County, COA 19-204, and RAB Builders LLC versus Buncombe County and Buncombe County Board of Adjustment, 19CV 182. Uh, the next matter, uh, is an economic development matter um, under North Carolina General Statute 143-318-A4 to discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries or businesses in the areas served by the public body. Great. So moved. Second. Motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, no decisions are expected following the Closed session, we will, we anticipate we'll simply adjourn and we'll be back.